Patrick's Day falls on a Sunday during Lent was the inspiration for this.
chapter of Augustine that I showed you in January. Uh, unfortunately for Pelagius, and I would argue for all of Christianity, uh, Pelagius came into conflict with Augustine and the church in Rome because his theology was directly at odds with Augustine's. I love how it looks like Augustine is kind of giving Pelagius the stink eye. Yeah. Rather than believing, as Augustine did, that humanity is born evil and depraved and stained through the fall of Adam, Pelagius had a strong sense of the goodness of creation, believing that in creation the life of God can be glimpsed and that God's spirit was present in every aspect of creation. There is no creature on earth in whom God is absent, he wrote in one of his letters. When God pronounced that his creation was good, it was not only that his hand had fashioned every creature, it was that his breath had brought every creature to life. The presence of God's spirit is what makes them beautiful. And if we look with God's eyes, nothing on the earth is ugly. This belief in the goodness of creation is at the heart of Celtic spirituality. And it is the root of the criticism that the church had about Pelagius. One of these criticisms was his appalling practice of teaching women to read scripture. And this practice came out of Pelagius's conviction that God's image is to be found in every person, both male and female. And even more controversial, was his conviction that every child is conceived and born in the image of God. He believed that the newborn contains the original unsullied goodness of creation and humanity's essential blessedness. This, of course, was in stark contrast to Augustine's thinking that humanity is conceived and born in sin. In Augustine's theology, God became human as Jesus in order to offer atonement for sin through the, his death on the cross. But Pelagius and those who followed him believed that God became human in Jesus to show us what being truly human looked like and to declare that the image of God could never be completely eradicated because God is the one who fashioned us in God's image. And in Christ, who is the perfect image of God, we can see our truest self. The church found his teachings dangerous enough that in 418, Pelagius was tried for heresy, found guilty, excommunicated, and banished. His death date is usually given as 418. I don't think he died that year. <laughs> I think he just faded from memory. Now, Pelagius may have been found heretical, but the conviction he had about the goodness of creation and humanity's original blessing were not his alone. They reflected the belief of the Celtic world, and these ideas continued to flourish in Ireland, Britain, and Scotland for centuries after Pelagius. Now, there's no evidence that uh, Patrick and Pelagius ever met, although it's not outside the realm of possibility because their timelines overlap. Uh, Patrick was born in 389, some 30 years or more after Pelagius. He was a third generation Christian. It's said that his father was a deacon and his grandfather was a priest, but we don't really know. As a youth, he lived a relatively comfortable life, the son of a minor Roman official somewhere on the western coast of Roman Britain perhaps in Wales. At the age of 16, he was kidnapped by Irish raiders, stolen from his home, and taken to Ireland as a slave. He found himself sold to a local king who employed him in a variety of menial occupations, such as herding livestock in the desolate mountains of the north. And as a slave, his life was not valued more highly than the beasts he tended. 
As he later wrote, I was chastened exceedingly and humbled every day in hunger and nakedness. Far from home and with little prospect of ever seeing his family again, he remembered who he was and where he came from. He clung to his faith as a Christian. Although previously he had been relatively indifferent to his faith, now he had long days on the, on the hills among his flocks to recite the prayers that had been impressed on him since childhood, all the while dreaming of escape. And after six years in captivity, an opportunity arose, and he took a risky journey of 200 miles to the coast. He found a place on a boat sailing east and eventually made his way home again. Now, Patrick was convinced that both his suffering as a slave and his escape had been designed for a, design, a divine purpose. He traveled to Gaul to study for the priesthood and in time was consecrated as a bishop. While living in Gaul, he had a series of dreams which, in which Irish voices, the voices of those who had stolen his youth, cried out to him, We beseech thee to come and walk once more among us, those voices said to him. And so in 432, over the objections of his superiors, he returned to the people who had once enslaved him, determined to offer not retribution, but a peaceful conversion to Christ. Most of the stories of St. Patrick are the stuff of legend, like the driving out of the snakes. But his achievement, spreading the gospel of Jesus to thousands of people, is a matter of historical record, and it was done without a battle. It was done in love. For the rest of his life, some 30 years, he was a wandering bishop, baptizing thousands of people, ordaining hundreds of priests, and establishing churches and monasteries throughout Ireland. His life as a slave was over, but he never forgot being held against his will and living without the freedom that he had once taken for granted. And as a result, he denounced any attempt to own or destroy another human being. His writing, rooted in Celtic tradition, shows a mature theology and an understanding that the work of God is exemplified by honoring the dignity of every human being. Coming some 150 years after the death of St. Patrick, Hild, Eighth century, early eighth century. Okay, where's the button? There we go. So here's Northumbria up here. Um, Edinburgh is right about there. And this is Whitby, that little spot right there, about halfway down the coast, eastern coast of England. Um, and that's where Hild uh, was an abbess. She was part of a royal Anglo Saxon family and baptized at the age of 13. And very little is known of her early life until she decided to become a nun at the age of 33. She spent time in several monasteries in East Anglia, which is right here, that little thumb that sticks out. Uh, and then she was asked to become the founding abbess of a new monastery in what is now modern day Whitby. Uh, it was known by another name in her time, and I have no ability to pronounce it. But none of you know Old English, so it probably wouldn't matter how I pronounced it. So on the beaches uh, around the town of Whitby, one can find ammonite fossils. That's an ammonite. The coiled shells of long extinct sea creatures. And legend says that these are the remains of decapitated snakes that Hild turned to stone 
saving the people from a plague of snakes. And because of this legend, she is sometimes portrayed with Ammonites at her feet. So this is an old stone uh, monument to Hild. I don't know when this dates from, but, but you can see the snakes, some of them decapitated there um, at her feet. Whitby was what's known as a double monastery, one comprised of both men and women who lived separately in separate little cottages, but they gathered communally for prayer and worship. In the Celtic tradition, it was not unusual for women to preside over such a mixed community. And it was also not unusual for the monastery rather than the cathedral to be the center of community life in a town. In the Celtic monastery, communal life was emphasized rather than the hierarchical structure that dominated the Roman church. And the Celtic church was, as one source puts it, relational rather than rational and inspirational rather than institutional. By all accounts, Hild was an extraordinary religious leader. She is said to have set a standard for holiness, wisdom, and scholarship, promoting through her example the virtues of peace and charity. It was said that in her monastery, no one there was rich or poor, for everything was held in common and none possessed any personal property. Hild was known as an exceptional spiritual director who advised not only those in her monastery, but those in the wider community who came to her for her deep wisdom and counsel. She became known as a gifted teacher who cultivated the gifts of others. Five monks in her abbey went on to become bishops. Those are the five faces that are surrounding Hild. Those are the five bishops that were part of her monastery. And she was instrumental in encouraging the poet Cadmon, who is the earliest English poet whose name and work are known. He was a cowherd in her monastery. During Hild's lifetime, the Roman church began to exert more influence over Christians living in England, and conflicts developed between the practices of the Celtic and Roman churches. And in 664, the king of Northumbria convened a synod at Hild's monastery to resolve the issue. Now to us, the primary conflicts seem odd and not especially divisive. They were very concerned about how the church was to calculate the date of Easter and the proper hairstyle for monks. The tonsure, you know, the, the haircut that monks get. The Celts did it differently from the Romans. But underneath these surface conflicts was the real conflict. Which spirituality would prevail in England? The Celtic spirituality with its belief in the goodness of creation and a monastic model of leadership, or Roman spirituality with its Augustinian belief in human depravity and a more hierarchical model of authority? After much debate, the king chose the Roman church, and in the years that followed, the Celtic way began to decline. It's a testament to Hild's leadership and diplomacy that although she preferred the Celtic church practices and she advocated for them at the synod, she kept the peace in her monastery and she used her influence to encourage acceptance of Roman practices. She remained the abbess at Whitby until her death, in 680, and her last words to her community were to maintain the gospel peace among yourselves and with others. From out of the mists of time, saints like Hild and Patrick and heretical theologians like poor old Pelagius teach us that there is a different path in the way of Jesus a path that is rooted in the goodness of creation and a belief in humanity's original blessing. This path wasn't a, a flash in the pan, ephemeral thing, but it was a gospel-rooted spirituality practiced by faithful Christians for hundreds of years. And it's a path available to us if we allow ourselves to lean on the shoulder of Jesus and listen for the heartbeat of God.